Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to begin? Look no further. The team at Dodge Media Productions has 20 years of experience as podcast listeners and observing the industry and eight years experience in podcast production. We can help you take your podcast from idea to fruition and we'll make the process seamless and easy. We'll help you with everything from recording and editing to hitting the charts on Apple Podcasts. So what are you waiting for? Contact us today and let's get started. DodgeMediaProductions.com You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. This is episode 143, and we are going to talk about one of our favorites, 1986's Three Amigos. We watched this on Amazon. We did have to pay $3.89 to rent it, and it was well worth it. We probably own this, but we (laughs) sadly don't own a DVD player. So this film was directed by John Landis, who also did Anima House in 78, Blues Brothers in 80, and Into the Night, like we mentioned in June or July. I can't remember. Let's see. It was June. Let's see. In 85, he did Into the Night. And then in, uh, also in 85, he did Spies Like Us. This film stars Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, Martin Short, Alfonso Aru, who is a very well-known uh, Mexican actor and director. He played El Guapo. Tony Plant played Jefe. John Lovitz and Joe Manteng... Oh, how do you say his name? Mantegna. But Mantegna is in this as well as Phil Hartman. The DP for this film is Ronald Brownie. He did 65 episodes of the television show Miss Mission Impossible. Whoa. And also, he did 17 episodes of The Six Million Dollar Man, 178 episodes of Coach, 51 episodes of Third Rock from the Sun, and 200 episodes of the That 70s Show. So very big in episodic television. The writer for this film was Steve Martin... Uh, Lauren Michaels and Randy Newman, and I got confirmation of that. So, Michael, it was not just a vanity credit. Okay. And it's the only film that Randy Newman was ever credited on. As a writer? Yes. Same with Lauren, right? This is his sole writing credit? Correct. He, I mean, he's written other television specials, but this was the only film. The synopsis for this film is three actors accept an invitation to a Mexican village to perform their on-screen bandit fighter roles, unaware that it is the real thing. I think I only have one tagline for you. Okay. They're down on their luck and up to their necks in senoritas, margaritas, banditos, and bullets. Well, that's a pretty succinct description of the film. I'm okay with that. According to Lorne Michaels... Uh, Steve Martin approached him with the idea for the film and asked him to co-write it with him. Martin originally, Steve Martin originally had a working title of Three Caballeros, like the um, Disney movie, but then they had to change it to The Three Amigos. To avoid copyright problems, presumably. Mm -hmm. And this one had a lot of casting issues. Originally, Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi were going to star with Steve Martin. And so they had trouble. They went through quite a few different... At one point, Robin Williams was going to be the character or one of the characters. I think he was going to play the Ned Nederlander, maybe, but I Mm -hmm. I could have that. Oh, no. He was going to play the Chevy Chase character and uh, Dusty Bottoms. And Ned was going to be Rick Moranis. Okay, that makes a little more sense, but I have to say that I, I can't see Ned Nederlander as anybody but Martin Short. I know, I know. This was his first film, which is really exciting for him. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, John Landis was... The trial had ended um, that we mentioned when we were talking about Into the Night, the Twilight Zone tragedy. The trial had ended, but it was kind of going on, let's see, during, fil- during the editing. And so Landis turned in... Uh, version and the studio didn't like it and so they heavily edited it after he had submitted it to them I'd be curious to see the director's cut in I believe it was the 30 year anniversary on the DVD under the deleted scenes there is a scene with none other than Fran Drescher 
who was completely cut from the film because her character really didn't need to be there. And I did find the clip on YouTube. I'll put it a, a link to it in the show notes. There's reference of it when they're trying to, when Steve Martin is up above and he's trying to get their attention. You who <laughs> the billboard behind, cause her character's name oh, was Miss right. Renee. And so there's a film that's being advertised and the billboard behind says something about Miss Renee. And I just learned that the film is, what is, I can't remember the name of the film, but basically in Singing in the Rain, they're making a film and that's the film that's being advertised on. Ah, not Springtime for Hitler. That's a different film. it is not. So I have a newfound appreciation for the poor editor when the producer walks in and says, you got to get rid of the Fran Drescher character. (laughs) And he's got to go back and like, oh, crud oh she wasn't in much she was in like one or two scenes it's like one scene right and then another character that got cut was sam kinnison played a character i can't remember what his character was but he was in it and he also got cut was he big at the time this film was made or is this early before he kind of hit his fame I, i don't know his career well enough to answer that okay so steve martin his lasso abilities he sold trick lassos at Disneyland when in, in his twenties. And so that's where he learned all of the lasso tricks Wow, that he did. Very impressive. And then famously I'll do this. And then we, you can tell us your pickup line. There were different, there were difficulties between Chevy Chase and Landis and there, I believe it's the scene with the water you know, where they're Steve, riding in the desert uh-huh. and they're thirsty and Steve has run out of water. And I should say, what was Steve's character? Lucky star. Yeah. So lucky star had run out of water. And then when Ned Niederlander tips back his canteen, it's full of like grit and sand and dust. And then Chevy Chase is just, his canteen is full, a wealth of water. And <laughs> He's gargling it. He's spitting it out. Like he has, and he throws it away, and it just pours, it pours the water <laughs> on the on the desert. It's a great scene. So I don't know if it's that, but Chevy Chase said that there was a line that Landis wanted him to deliver, and he was like, "No, I won't do it because it'll make my character look like he's a moron." And Landis was thinking to himself, like, has he not been listening to the dialogue in this movie? Like, they're all idiots. Right. <laughs> they're all <laughs> And he was like, okay, I'll give it to to Martin Short. And Chevy was fine with that. He was like, okay, cool. And Martin was happy to deliver the line. So, I and to, it's like, Landis, it's his favorite part of the whole film is that interaction with Chevy yeah. Chase. Uh, so I would say this is, you know, probably something every director needs to have in their back pocket when an actor says, oh, I, I don't want to deliver that line. Just say, OK, I'll give it to your scene partner. Right. Um, that, that, that If there's any competitiveness there, that's going to trigger it. Right. Yeah. So what is your pickup line? I actually have two. Ah. So bear with me on this one. Mm-hmm. The film opens with the three amigos singing. There's no video. It's just over, over the credits. But the lyric, the line they sing the first time we see them on screen, so on camera, is wherever they need us, our destinies lead us, which is very on the nose. Yes. Now, the first line of spoken dialogue is Rodrigo, which is spoken by Carmen, the pretty girl that hires them later. Rodrigo is her little brother. And they actually sang that song that was written by Randy Newman. They sang that song. Now it is unknown whether they held that note for 14 seconds or there was some movie magic there, Right. but they were the ones singing. So impressive. Excellent work on their part. Yeah. And I will mention that Chief Martin and Martin Short went on to do some other work, including a show that I'm currently watching, which I'm late to the party, which is only murders in the building. So they went on to work together again, at least the ones. You're watching it by yourself? No, I didn't want to speak for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh. Well, because I'm, I'm... I thought we were watching it. But I'm slow to the party. I didn't want you to seem like you were, were the, the laggard. I was the one who saw the title and said, this makes no sense. Only murders in the building? What building would have multiple murders? I am, like, I'm not into this. 
It, it says my it fault, off. my fault yeah. that, that it's a slow watch. But I'm catching up, folks. So I did not remember that this film was set in 1916. So this is excellent that you mentioned this because I believe the Wild Bunch is also in like 1910, 1915, somewhere in there. And in my mind, Westerns are basically 1850 to 1880, right around the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And this is substantially, right? This is two generations after the Civil War. But maybe in rural Mexico, there were still vaqueros, caballeros, amigos. Well, and... But I feel like because it's 1916, we have like a German soldier at Correct. a certain point. Aircraft. And, and we see some German aircraft. And then I thought there's like some crates of weaponry that mm-hmm. have some German markings on it. Yeah. Yeah. So this would have been, as you identify during the film, in the middle of World War One. I. I loved the scene in the church. There's way too many candles lit, probably for safety, especially back then. <laughs> the projectionist, because I remember, do you know why it's 20 movies are usually done in 24 frames per second? Well, I think originally there was a song that they would hum or, or use as the beat. And is that because that was the, uh, the rhythm of that song? Yes. And so projectionists used it because we didn't have mechanical electrical like um they had to rotate a hand projectors so there had to be a human being who would turn the projector to feed the film in front of the bulb and so in this i forgot this part but i see this guy and i was like oh my gosh there it is it was just very cool to see that the projectionist and that's why some movies they would look like they were walking really fast because a human being can't keep a steady twenty four frames right. per second like modern cameras can. I, I think camera operators that was a point of pride that they could maintain a consistent rotational speed. Yeah. Right. But then obviously you could do faster, slower based on the crank speed when you're re- re- shooting it. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it was the same basic mechanism whether you are taking the original exposures or you are projecting them. Right. And I'll just skip ahead for this part it, at the very beginning so that we, we meet the three amigos and that's where the audience learns that they are film actors instead of actual, you know, caballeros. And the actors wore the actual lead-based makeup that they used to wear wow. back in the silent era at their own peril. <laughs> Yeah, you probably don't want to do that too much. Like, really? In 1980, we couldn't find some similar white makeup to lighten their face? And, you know, I don't know. I just, when I read that, I was just like, guys. Okay. I don't think, were they trying to, you know how, you know how like Arnold will like pump iron or, you know, that what they'll, what they'll do for the role. Is that what comedians do? Like, oh, we'll risk our life. <laughs> yeah. Putting on the lead makeup. I was actually thinking though, that's in the same vein as so- someone who makes a realistic business card that's going to be seen in two frames uh, at a distance. Right. I, I-, I get it. Commitment. That is commitment. And-, and that was, by the way, accurate. The extra dark lip makeup and then the extra white Face makeup, that was period correct. I loved the part when they just lost their jobs. They're even rendered almost naked, right? They're in their skivvies standing out. And Ned says, I know show business and something always turns up. And the guy pedals up on the thing. (laughs) On the bike. Yeah. (laughs) um, Telegram for the three amigos. (laughs) (laughs) That was great. Yeah. And speaking of, of that scene when they're in their undergarments, I noticed that all three were wearing sock garters, which I've previously mentioned Ed or Mertz on the I Love Lucy show introduced me to, but also Steve Martin is wearing spats. And I only know those from oh, band. The, They're the, 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 the white things, things over your shoes. Yeah. And I... When you stop and think about it, I think the bands got them from, they were at some point fashionable, probably in 1910, but I don't, I can't think of the last time I saw an actor on screen wearing them. There's some really funny gags in this. I mean, ones that we still repeat to this day. And Landis says that he does this too. 
there's a funny <laughs> scene that I had forgotten. This isn't even one we repeat, but D- Dusty Bottoms is eating. He has a tortilla and he's putting some meat in the tortilla and then he rolls it up and kind of almost <laughs> like a child. Right. He holds it completely vertical and he hold, he's holding it very loosely. I mean, when you really see people eat with tortillas, they kind of, you know, grip the tortilla <laughs> tightly around the meat. But he just kind of rolls it. Oh, yeah. And when he holds it vertically, of course, everything falls out and he's frustrated and he just kind of he does look like a four year old. just And he goes, do you have anything other than Mexican food? <laughs> And Landis said he was traveling with his wife in India and they had been there many nights. So of course you're eating. And it was funny because (laughs) I thought he would change the line to like kind of be funny to the waiter. Like, do you have anything other than Indian food? That's the joke. No, he kept the line. He (laughs) said, do you have anything other than Mexican food? And apparently his long suffering wife looked at him and goes, honey, they've never seen your movie. They have no idea what you're saying. (laughs) Oh, that is so awesome. I know. I like Um, that. I have to say probably the line of my own film that I use the most is I don't know whether to be impressed or mortified. I heard you say it the other day. Yeah. And guess what? No one else recognizes it. Nope. Just like John Landis. They haven't (laughs) seen my film. Um, (laughs) Another joke that I didn't remember from before, which I actually thought was pretty funny, was there's a, a woman who's trying to get Dusty Bottoms to kiss her. Because they're temporarily big thing, big shots in the, in the, in the, the town. And she says, maybe you can kiss me on the veranda. And Dusty says, on the lips would be fine. <laughs> that's, your, that's a classic joke for you. Yeah, it really is. One thing that I, I didn't recognize, very much a callback to Blazing Saddles, is they're referring to the things that the bad guys do. And they mentioned that they did nasty things to the horses. <laughs> And I was just, wow, this film isn't really that edgy. That line kind of startled me. Like, that doesn't seem in keeping with this, the, the humor of this film. That's such a funny scene because Dusty Bottoms is trying to <laughs> impersonate and kind of blend in. And so they're like, what are we going to do? I shouldn't right. do an accent. What are we going to do? And so he goes, and so he says, like, we're going to do nasty things to the horses. And then he kind of is, and we're, and we're going to steal. And he says all the things that Benditos would do. And then I love it because he goes, and we are going to prune. I need to stop doing an accent. We're going to prune. And the guy repeats it. He goes, yes, we are going to prune. And then he kind of looks like, what are we pruning? And he goes, the shrubs. And the shrubs, yes, the shrubs. (laughs) It's so silly. And this film introduced me and I think millions of other people to the word plethora. I misremembered it as a plethora of sweaters that El Guapo gets, but actually he refers only to a plethora of piñatas. But this was so popular at the time that non-film nerds would quote plethora. So Mm -hmm. this did have a big impact, I think, on, on pop culture of the day. So they had to... Oh, is there anything in cinematography and writing before I go on? I was going to go to sets. Well, cinematography, there are a couple of things here. You mentioned um, our cinematographer had a lot of work in, in episodic television. There's a fun dolly to match Lucky Day when he's on top of the wall trying to sneak in. And so they, they dolly to the left and it reveals the Fran Drescher billboard. But then the one that really struck me was when the Mexican comes out of the bar in like Santa Poco or wherever. What a complicated shot. So they they dolly and then pan and then push back. Like it was such a complicated camera move for the German just coming out of the saloon. I wasn't exactly sure why Landis would need that shot. Mm -hmm. Somebody working on the reel? (laughs) Yeah, probably so. That's what we say when we see a fancy shot. So they did have to build quite a few of the sets for this. And the cantina at the beginning of the movie is called the Cantina del Borracho, which translates to the Cantina of the Drunk. Oh, nice. Or the Bar of the Drunk. (laughs) That's funny. Speaking of the canteen, that's where the infamous earworm, My Little Buttercup, written by Randy Newman, takes place and randy newman was also the voice of the singing bush that they the three of them come on to speaking of the singing bush i found a video of a guy who was putting forth the theory that (laughs) the bats that they eat 
at the campfire because bats commonly carry rabies and one of the side effects of contracting rabies is hallucinations he feels like the rest of the film is a fever dream and that or and that basically the three of them died at the campfire and so all of the camera or all of the different animals coming in and and singing to them and then the singing bush and then their shootout with the the banditos is all just in their it's all a hallucination in their mind my guess is this person also believes that kubrick filmed the moon landings (laughs) um i yeah no i i don't really think that holds up but okay it's interesting I thought it was funny. And the bats were actually bacon. So kudos to whoever crafted because they were in the shape of a bat. And yes, I could see that they were bacon, but they had like wings and they had a head. And I was like, wow, I, I, okay. Well, Halloween upcoming, maybe some weekend I need to see if I can make bacon bats. Sure. Um, speaking of food and this film, I did wonder if the scene we talked about earlier where Ned Niederlander's cantina, his canteen had only um, dust dust in it, it looked to me like perhaps that was just cocoa powder, which would be Mm -hmm. tastier than sand for Martin. Yeah. I did wonder watching a clip getting ready for today's uh, recording. I did wonder if it was a little like cinnamon sugar with some cocoa powder yeah, thrown in. Yeah, look good. Um, and speaking though of of props, I thought this was a hilarious sight gag. In the, um, I think it's in the silent film when they're paid money, they're paid a bunch of pesos, but it's in a bag with a dollar sign on it. Yeah. <laughs> so not only is it the classic bit of putting the dollar sign on the bag of money so that the viewer knows it's got money, but it's got the wrong currency. <laughs> The scene, this uh, the scene where that I spoke about before around the campfire, where they sing "Blue Shadows" to Martin Short's character, was inspired by the live-action opening of Pecos Bill, the segment of Disney's Melody Time, uh, where they also sing a song called "Blue Shadows" while a group of animals watch. Steve Martin was a huge fan of Pecos Bill. Is that a TV show, or was it a Disney like? Little like oh, I think it might have been a Disney animated. I don't want to say a short, but kind of like yeah, yeah. Sometimes before the longer movies, they would maybe have a shorter movie, right? And unfortunately, Steve Martin got tinnitus after spending so much time around the prop guns after this film. Wow! So that answers uh, the question of whether they use squibs or blanks. Uh, so is for, one louder than the other? Yeah, yeah. So squibs are just a, a small, tiny charge. And with a revolver like that, where you're not relying on the recoil to cycle the action, mm-hmm. you can use them because the trigger pull is what rotates the cylinder. And they're quieter and less recoil. But then you have to <laughs> put in the sound later. The sound okay. guy has to add the gunfire. But it's easier on the actors. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you right. just were getting in the weeds there a little bit. No, I give me 10 seconds. It was quick. Okay, listeners have to write in and say if I was going on too much, because I, I, I believe I was maybe 15 seconds. I was quick. Okay, please write in. Spielberg was supposed to direct this, but I think he had directed another comedy. I want to say it was called 1941, but I could be wrong with that in my cramming before this episode. But he, and, and it didn't do so well. So I think he was worried that he couldn't really do like a screwball comedy. Mm-hmm. And so, plus he was given the opportunity to do E.T. And he was kind of like, bye guys, got to go make my my big hit, right. E.T. It's funny, I, I, I saw a, a TED talk where somebody said, as part of their talk, wouldn't you, if you came to the door, hold the door for Steven Spielberg and their implication was because of his body of work and I would hold the door, but I'm just a nice person in general. I'd hold the door for anybody, even though I do respect his body of work. Was there any head trauma in this film? I presume that every single one of the bad guys that gets shot and either falls off of a roof or through a railing that when they landed, there was some head trauma. I'm going to go ahead and assume that lucky uh, must have hit his head when he was shot off his horse. And there's a a scene where I paused and went back. I think there was an accidental running over of a stunt person. There were two horses that were crossing in opposite directions. 
and the stunt guy moved to get out of the first horse, which was further back from the camera, and appears to just step right in front of the other horse and gets obliterated. I mean, this horse's chest knocks him out of frame. I'm going to say head trauma. And then uh, Dusty throws a rock as a diversion, and it hits the guard in the head, who falls for probably second head trauma. Uh, Carmen whacks the sleeping guard in the head with the pistol butt, which is actually pretty dangerous. Ned lands on his head on the table after falling from when he's stuck with the piñatas. And El Guapo just says, are gringos falling from the sky? And Ned does, in fact, fall from the sky. (laughs) That's a great scene. Yeah. How about a smoochie? Was there a love story in this film? Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. Well, there was a little bit of, we have a, Dusty refuses this proposed smoochie, and then Carmen kisses Lucky when they say goodbye. And I love the twist on this because Lucky says, like, you know, I'll come back sometime. And she's like, Why? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I just love that whole. Uh, no, okay, you're good. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> that was um, one of Steve Martin's. His other favorite, his favorite joke in the whole movie was written by I believe Lauren. He's I, I think it was somebody else wrote it, not him. And it's when El Guapo gets his presents and he opens it up and he goes, "Eat a sweater." <laughs> I really have to stop doing. Uh, and. Uh, cars were not was there one car there was a single model t that we saw which tells us what time it is right Mm -hmm. that establishes a minimum year for it now it's not a car but it's the plane plays a prominent role in this and ned niederlander recognizes it as a tubman 601 from a previous film Which is funny because he says, oh, I flew that in such and such film. And then later they need him to fly it. And he's like, oh, well, that was actually a stunt person. (laughs) But I I think I remember. (laughs) And the Tubman 601 doesn't exist, but this is awesome. There is a brewing company called Santa Poco Brewing that makes a beer called the Tubman 601 now. (laughs) That's nice. Nice callback. that's funny. There is an article on the internet that says a Cessna 310 was used for the Tubman 601 Don't know how that's possible because the Cessna 301 is a single wing, multi-engine aircraft, not a multi-wing single engine aircraft like the one we obviously see, but nonetheless. So that plays a big thing, including one of the silly jokes. It's a mail plane. How do you know it's a mail plane? (laughs) It's the tiny little ball. So yeah, I was going to include that scene too on the show notes because it's a good one. Yeah, it is a fascinating one. As well as the yoo-hoo up here. That Uh, one we repeat all the time in the family. all All the time. I have since I've seen that that made me I have a vivid memory of my mom and I just laughing so hard at that scene so this film I I had forgotten how much I love this film Mm -hmm. until we watched it again but another interesting piece of trivia not listed on the IMDb page is the very first dog I could have had was named Dusty Bottoms after this film Wow. Yeah, yeah. I actually had Dusty for about a day until my horrible family of origin made me give the dog back. That's just cruel. It really is. Especially to me. I love dogs. I mean, come on. Right. Oh, I wonder what where Dusty is today. Uh, probably <laughs> in heaven. <laughs> All dogs go to heaven. Uh, hey, that would be a good name for a film. So we go to... Oh, there's so much. Anyway, shall we go to the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. So before I head up there to my notes, I'm going to include a a link to a clip. Rex Reed and Mr. Harris, I can't remember his first name, had a show very similar to like Siskel and Ebert. And they, and he shredded this movie. And because this movie has become kind of like a cult classic, I just think listening to his review after the fact and just how he talks about the moronic script and the you know just the way that he shreds this movie apart it's almost so over the top it feels like a snl skit kind of and it's just so funny it's not even like like i think if steve martin watched it he would laugh i don't think he would be offended right It's like somebody tearing apart Citizen Kane cinematography or something. (laughs) And it just the language he used, it just, it cracked me up. I don't know. I found it funny. Listeners, if you want, go to the show notes, 
Go to the link, watch it, tell me if it's funny or offensive. I thought it was hilarious. How Not because I agree with him, but just how ridiculous his review is, I guess. Well, and you said Cisco and Ebert didn't like it either? They didn't like it either. They gave it one star. And I think this is what was going on because Roger Ebert, he talked about how I think at the time Martin Short was on SNL and he was doing a lot of these like crazy characters. Oh, like, like that Ed Grimley guy? Yes. And okay. if you think about it, a lot of his characters, he used a word, was it active or I can't remember what word he used. And if you think about it, Ned's character is a little bit more demure. So they're used to seeing him every week just be wild and crazy to steal Steve Martin's right. bit. And and now you see Ned that is just you, now you see Ned being a little bit more demure and quiet and just not stoic, but just quieter. And I wonder now that you see his body of work, that's just Martin Short. Like he can play funny and quiet. Right. You know, like his character on Oliver Murders. Putnam. Yeah, he's he's not very uh, he's a still physically still. And he has funny lines, which he delivers, but it's not the physical comedy, the broad comedy. Right. And so I think that, and I, I felt like they almost like took this too seriously. Like, really, guys? Yes. The, like, it, that would be a problem if you take this so film like, serious. You ha- like, this is totally a movie to get stoned, eat a pizza, and just watch. <laughs> like, it's just a fun movie. It's just silly. It's Right. And so, I don't know, I was surprised. But this one has come to to become like a cult classic. I mean, tons of people love this movie. Okay, so to the numbers. It had a budget of $25 million, and it made 39 in 1986. I do not have an adjusted figure for that. It gets a 6.5 out of 10 on IMDb. Critics gave it 45%. I, yeah, it's not, but critics don't really rate comedies. They don't like comedies. Yeah. Yeah. But audiences, and I think this is low, give it 67%. I, that is most people I talk to. In fact, I watched an interview, a modern interview with Conan O'Brien. He was interviewing Steve and Martin for murders in the building. So it was a current interview. And he said in his experience, when he talks to other comedians and band rock stars and different what's your favorite movie it comes up more frequently than others and yeah so, totally so this this is a good movie okay i don't need to defend it it's a good movie it's just shy of two hours at well not just shy it's 144 <laughs> i just realize i say that every week but i say should say it when it's like 156 Okay, it's an hour and three quarters. Yes. <laughs> it's rated PG and it's listed as a comedy western. So it was filmed in Florence, Tucson, Coronado National Forest, Apache Junction, around Arizona, and also Culver City. And it was, an, it was a home box office, so old HBO film. All right, that does it, you guys. We're punchy. We're tired. (laughs) (laughs) Please leave us a review if you have loved this episode or any of the previous 142 episodes. We really appreciate it. We're getting close to 150. We'll hit it by the end of the year. We have super exciting news about next year and how we're going to pick our films. I think you're going to love it. Stay tuned to December for that announcement. And in the meantime, never forget. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies.